looks like might be good. So we've got a couple people here. If you can hear me, please let me know. So this is the book we are going to be going through and discussing today. Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. One thing I love about this book is it is a very easy read. Um, yeah, there's the Van der Kolk book, which I found to be very dense. This one is an easy, relatable read, and it's definitely a must-have. Um, I want to say for anybody with complex PTSD, but the more I think on the people I've met and the interactions I've had, most people have some form of this or can relate to what's in here. Uh, in this day and age based on the state of humanity. So, um, a little bit about me. My name's Adele Rancheran. Um, you can check out, I have only one video posted on this channel. This is my second channel. My main channel is just my name, Adele Rancheran. I'll, I'll link that in the description if you want to check it out. And um, I had a very difficult childhood. I've had a very difficult life and pretty much any time I watch a video from like the crappy childhood fairy um, or oh who's that other really good guy she had him as a guest on her channel I can't remember his name at the moment um, but yeah any of the CPTSD videos books they always speak directly to my heart and I'm filming this right here because I just kind of had an inclination to do it. I am in Mexico right now. This is like my favorite window. There's a bunch of windows like all lined up here. I've got these beautiful trees with hummingbirds and birds coming to my window every day. Um, I've walked so much. I walk everywhere. Um, and I'm getting so much sun, I'm feeling so healthy and so good. Um, but I am going through some really difficult things, um, like my divorce. So, yeah, I have been really getting support from people online in a way that I never would have expected. I've been getting support from my life coach, therapists. Um, I've got a great group of ex expats here. We just went out for tacos the other night, and I've been here for about a week, and this is my first time um, going to a restaurant here <laughs> because nobody speaks, well, it's occasionally you'll find someone who speaks English, but generally no. So uh, I'm in the process of learning Spanish, and so I've gone through so many things, and even just the process of marriage and divorce, it brings up all of these things that I thought I was done with. You know, I'm going to be 40 next year, and I thought, oh, I'm done with these things. You know, I've done all this work. I've finally moved on, and that has not been the case. So today, um, but so anyways, what I have realized is that in coming here and in the process that I went through to get here, the bravery, the courage, um, the belief in myself, I realized that going through this difficult process was revealing the growth that I have indeed made, even though... Um, I was still in some difficult circumstances. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to make this video about. I packed 10 pounds of books <laughs> to bring with me coming here because I'm like, I'm going to need the support from my friends, people online. I've been reaching out to family that has been reconnecting with me, people who have seen my videos, and they're like, I had no idea you guys were going through that, stuff like that. And I'm like, I'm going to need my books. So... I want to make videos about all of my cool books that I brought, and I'll probably start doing that. I really have a drive to be back on the channel and create, and I have been working on things, but um, 
I guess it's, uh, it's taking me a bit of time to get it together. You have to understand, I went through culture shock, going through grief, mourning, um, just everything. And so, yeah, I took this book out one night and I started, I was like, I'm going to downsize all my stuff. I just got here and I'm already stressed out that I have too many things. This apartment is furnished. So I was like, I don't need half the stuff I brought. I want to travel light. But as I, um, so I was like, let me go through my books. Let me highlight and photocopy anything that I need. And then I can throw the books out because <laughs> I took so many big books. I took up so much room. But then I'm like, oh, wow, this book is just so so on point it's like someone studied my life and wrote a book about it and like honestly I know this sounds a little it's, it sounds kind of hard to believe but I hate to think that other people are suffering or have suffered in the way that I have in my life I should have had the, oh yes I good I have Kleenex here just in case um yeah, which I knew was happening because, you know, I have brothers who went through the same childhood as me, but they experienced other terrible things as well. But um, so anyway, the, the fact that there is a book like this out there, it hurts me that it needs to exist, but I'm glad that it does. And let's get started. Uh, I kind of just wanted to. And so, yeah, these videos that I'm going to make are like catalogs for me that I can look back on and have the knowledge of these books if in the future I don't have the books uh, physically anymore because I am traveling. Um, and I thought that would be a great resource for other people. And I know that you guys have liked these kind of candid chats. I wanted to show you this nice window. Um, you can kind of get some of the sights and sounds of small town Mexico. Um, if it gets too noisy, which it sometimes does, then I'll have to continue at another time. Um, if anything kind of stands out to you or anything you can relate to, please click the thumbs up button. Um, put something in the chat. Put a comment below this video. Um, and let us all support you. Speak up and get the ideas or the thoughts or the feelings from out inside of you, from, uh, inside of you to out in the world. That's a great way to start healing. So, let's get going. Let me see if I can angle this down a bit more. So this is still kind of like a little bit of a learning process. So here, let me give you guys the shot, the full shot of this window. How do I, hold on, there we go. Isn't that pretty? There you go. All right, I'm gonna give you a better shot of the book now. All right, perfect. And then I'm going to go dance to Wild Child by Enya. <laughs> and watch, and watch um, interviews with her. Wild Child by Enya is the, um, the theme song for me at this point in my life. Uh, I just love that song. And I love to, to blast it. Of course, in my headphones, I don't want to be annoying to my neighbors, my new neighbors. So I blast it in my headphones and I dance around for like half an hour. <laughs> and then I look up interviews with Enya and her castle and her devotion to her music above anything else online. And I just feel really inspired. Um, and that's what we really have to kind of focus on during these difficult times are the things that make us feel uplifted and inspired. All right. So let's hit the first. So I'm just going to go through and hit all the highlighted spots. And I might just read the highlighted spots. I might tell a bit of a story about it. But I think many people will be surprised by how relatable a lot of this content is to them. Sadly and unfortunately. All right. Where's the first highlighting? Come on, oh, there we go. We got something. Chapter one, the journey of recovering from CPTSD. I've got highlighted here. It is a learned, so the good, 
The good news about CPTSD, it's a learned set of responses and a failure to complete numerous important developmental tasks. That hit me. The failure to complete numerous important developmental tasks. Man, I could talk about that for, for ages. Um, I was just reading this book, uh, Mothers and Daughter Wisdom by C Christiane Northrup, and she was saying that adolescents need to have um, natural exposure to and interactions with the opposite sex in order to develop, you know, the appropriate ways of behavior and stuff like that. And I can think of people I know who haven't. That's one thing I was, I was lucky for, but I still, anyway, even when I think about, um, numerous important developmental tasks, being a child, having a childhood, that's one of them that I missed out on. A bunch of us missed out on, um, important developmental tasks, um, attachment bonds with a female figure or a male figure of which I had neither <laughs> growing up. Maybe some of you can relate or what does that kind of bring up for you? Let's look for the next highlight. Parents, okay. Emotional neglect also typically underlies most traumatizations that are more glaringly evident. Parents who routinely ignore or turn their backs on a child's call for attention, connection, or help abandon their child to unmanageable amounts of fear, and the child eventually gives up and succumbs to depressed, death-like feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. It reminds me of people I know. It reminds me of things I've gone through. And that just really hits home. When con oh God, this made me cry. <laughs> when contempt replaced the, replaces the milk of human kindness at an early age, the child feels humiliated and overwhelmed. Uh, the child eventually becomes convinced that he that she is defective and fatally flawed. Carol remains symbolically enthralled to the family by getting ensnared with narcissistic people who are just as abusive and neglectful as her parents. So we find that we find that the pain that we experienced from our parents that's unresolved, we end up with partners who treat it, who bring that same dynamic up for us again. It's called rep repetition compulsion or reenactment, traumatic reenactment. Trauma survivors are extremely susceptible to it. I love how he put susceptible to it. It's kind of like I, when I was really young, I read this book and it's talking about daddy issues. And I was like, what is daddy issues? And I was like 11 years old. So I, I figured it out in the context of the book. And I was like, oh, I am susceptible to daddy issues. So I need to watch out for this. So traumatic um, reenactment you're susceptible to it if you come from that uh, background so there's definitely some work that can be done there to help protect a person who is vulnerable um, oh I really loved this I loved this um, I don't know why I didn't highlight it I think I was gonna rip the whole page out and put it up somewhere list of the most common developmental arrests that occur in CPTSD and I like how he put these in a positive <laughs> in <laughs> a positive, a positive way. Um, oh, hey, you got a comment. I love this second channel. Thank you, Mike Powers. Good to see you. Yeah, this channel is a bit more casual. All right. So, yeah, self-acceptance. So you put, these are the things that you don't have if you suffer from CPTSD. So he doesn't put, you hate yourself. Maybe that's, these are the things you're arrested from. Self-acceptance clear sense of identity, self-compassion, self-protection. <sighs> Man, okay. Capacity to draw comfort from relationship, ability to relax, capacity for full self-expression, willpower and motivation, peace of mind, self-care, belief that life is a gift, you guys. Self-esteem and self-confidence. So if you want to know a list of everything I've struggled with in my life, it's this whole thing right here. I'm sure many of you can relate. And I am, based on the growth that I've seen, I'm realizing that I have come a long way in some of these. Like uh, my self-compassion, my self-protection is growing. 
um, my self-acceptance is, is growing. My self-compassion has been very high um, lately. And that's, that's really great. Um, belief that life is a gift. Gosh, I'm going to have to work on that one. Self-esteem and self-confidence. Those are coming as well. Okay. Uh, the ability to evoke, ev invoke willpower seems to be allied to your ability to healthily express your anger. And I just thought that was really valuable for someone that I know. Um, who just, yeah, suffers with a lot of anger. Some survivors have confidence but not self-esteem. I was like, wow, I realized that myself about a year and a half ago. And so many of these things, if you're doing the work, like I've said before, you start to come into it on your own. Um, the benefit of the benefit of these rewards never penetrated my toxic shame enough to allow me to feel that I was a worthwhile person. Yeah, I know that feel. Early abuse and abandonment forces the child to merge his identity with the superego, the part of the child's brain that learns the rules of his caretakers in order to get and maintain acceptance. This is when you see people who just seem like they're possessed by the rules of their abusive or toxic parents. The survivor becomes imprisoned by a jailer who will accept nothing but perfection. He's chauffeured by a hysterical driver who sees nothing but danger in every turn of the road. Hello, that's me with my hypervigilance. You want to see what that looks like on crack? You should see me when I first came to Mexico. I have a number of stories about that. And just yesterday, it finally started to let down. I have a friend here, um, an expat. She's an INTJ. <laughs> she's like very knowledgeable and very level-headed and rationally assessing everything she, I, that's what I love about INTJs you all are just brilliant people and I was telling her yesterday I'm like don't you want a bar for your door don't you want an alarm do you want this do you want that do you walk at night blah 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 and, and she told me that you know she's assessed everything she's researched everything she's put it in, in play and she doesn't need that here this is like a very safe place and she said, you know, you, you want to keep your wits about you and don't play the fool, but, you know, just talking to her, I, I, it made such a big difference for me. And, uh, yeah, when you've got this CPTSD, you really meet some cool people along the way who can help you. I put these next to things that, like, really were impactful for me. So the instinct to care for yourself and to protect yourself against unfairness is then forced to become dormant. These are people whose parents never let them stand up for themselves. And this is just reminds me of someone I'm recently dealing with. And that's kind of why I highlighted that. Psychologically speaking, mindfulness is taking undistracted time to become fully aware of your thoughts and feelings so that you can have more choice in how you respond to them. I love that definition. Uh, and this. Repression of one end of the emotional continuum often leads to a repression of the whole continuum and the person becomes emotionally deadened. Again, reminding me of someone that I've been dealing with uh, lately. I'm not going to say any details. But when you have someone who's been told you can never be sad, you can never be angry, and you just get completely bogged down so you don't get to experience that, you lose the joy, curiosity, vibrancy of life and emotionally deadened I was, I was like that is just that's intense so another highlighted one those who cannot feel their sadness often do not know when they are being unfairly excluded and those who cannot feel their normal angry or fearful responses to abuse are often in danger of putting up with it without protest again that's a personal situation I'm going through and things I've noticed in myself too like I remember telling people like I really don't understand like I, I've been in groups where after the group was done talking a couple people came over to me after and like oh my god Del, I'm so sorry I can't believe you know that person was so rude like oh, I'm just so embarrassed I'm so sorry and I remember sitting there like I have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> you know I just and I and and uh, there's so many work situations where I no, I don't really realize anything. And then later I'm like, wow, that was sexual abuse in the workplace. Wow, that was 
um, racial abuse in the workplace. And I just, I don't have that, I didn't have that protective instinct toward myself. And so I didn't realize it. Um, and I've seen that in other people. And it enrages me now. I have self-esteem to the degree that I keep my heart open to myself in all my emotional states. I really liked that. Most tra mm, traumatizing parents are especially contemptuous towards the child's expression of emotional pain. Oh, that made me cry too. It made me think of my baby brother's face when he would cry and how it would make me angry and it would make my brother angry and my mom angry and we would mock him. Honestly, we were living in hell. The environment that our mother created for us was, it was an emotional, physical hell. Emotional abandonment, relentless lack of parental warmth and love, not being liked by your parents, CPTSD inducing parents who say they love their children but demonstrate in a thousand ways that they do not like them. Emotional abu abuse and neglect scares us out of our own emotions while simultaneously making us terrified of other people's feelings. Reminds me of someone. That was one thing that I wasn't really... I didn't have emotional repression, really, in my house. Verbal ventilation, key bonding process in intimacy, key healing process of effective therapy. I thought that was really interesting. He talks about how, you know, verbal ventilation, um, being able to say to like someone who you're building an intimate bond with, oh, this is what I went through today. And it's not like constant complaining or emotional dumping on somebody. It's just saying, oh, here's what I went through. Oh, it was so difficult, you know, and then maybe coming to a solution or, you know, starting to settle down with it a bit or just get some empathy back from it. Oh, man, that does suck. Like, yeah, you know, okay, how about we go do this? Or, you know what I mean? But if you're with a partner who, when you start talking about anything deep or meaningful to you, they yawn or they start sighing or, you know, whatever it is, and then they wonder why there's no emotional intimacy, which results in lack of sexual intimacy too, which a lot of people struggle with in relationships too. A numinous, oh, I love this. A numinous experience is a powerful, moving feeling of well-being accompanied by a sense that there's a positive, benign force behind the universe as well as within yourself. This, in turn, sometimes brings enough grace with it that you have a profound feeling that you are essentially worthwhile, that you belong in this life, and that life is a gift. And I have felt that at brief moments, usually involving nature, or when I have a really good business business success. <laughs> when I apply the concept of good enough to people, I generally mean that a person is essentially good-hearted, likes to be fair, and meets his or her commitments a large portion of the time. I love that concept because nobody's perfect. Even when it comes to like traumatized people and getting into a relationship, the idea is not to find someone who has no trauma that you could get into a relationship with or that had like a perfect childhood so you're not gonna have problems. Um, the idea is like not even to find someone who is working on or has dealt with their problems because most of us are gonna deal with these things for the rest of our life to some degree. The, I think what I'm really realizing is that you need to find someone whose trauma matches well with your own. So for example, for me, um, and you have to consciously do that because you'll often be attracted to someone who will trigger your trauma. So I know for me, I, I'm attracted to uh, men who I feel like I, who are like, um, I feel like they're emotionally frozen and that I, ha I can dive in and save them. Or I can bring them back to life, which is like the dynamic with my mother where um, I felt like I had to save her. And then the dynamic with my father where he was just completely cold and unfeeling and cut off um he probably had my yeah and narcissistic um so when i have someone who wants to run away or hide or retreat when things are emotional it triggers me 
And so someone that might work better for me, and this sounds crazy, would be someone who has a trauma where they just get really aggressive when they're upset. I can handle that. I don't like it. I've never dealt with it because I'm not attracted to that, right? I'm attracted to the other trauma. But someone who is like gets more aggressive um, and who wants to maybe argue it out or something, that might be something that would work better for someone with my trauma type. So this is something I've been thinking about and realizing lately, which is very interesting. And I've been seeing, I, I don't know who I saw, was it what Richard Grannon who was talking about it? Children who receive good enough parenting easily recognize and protect themselves from bullying and exploitative people because they do not have to become accustomed to being treated unfairly. Oh shit, that hit me. That hit me so strongly um, for someone I know and also for myself. Uh, EMDR, somatic experiencing, incorporating inter inner critic, grieving the losses of childhood work, Rosen work, Rolfing, rebirthing, and Reikian work. He was saying these are the most effective treatments for CPTSD. Why do I have this folded over? Oh yeah, solutions. You all know I love solutions. Look at how dark my skin is getting. And my face is still light. So that's always interesting. I don't want to get sun on my face because uh, I'm not gonna get wrinkles and have foundation that doesn't match anymore. But I love getting the sun all over my body. Real relational, oh God, this made me cry. Real relational healing can and does come from non-human sources. Mammalian pets, and look at this. Dogs and cats can be a tremendous source of what Carl Rogers describes as the unconditional positive regard that young children must have in order to thrive. Doesn't that break your heart? They have that unconditional positive regard for us. <laughs> we just don't deserve it, but we get it from these beautiful animals. Oh. <laughs> I love the feeling of entering into a contract with an animal. Like when I was back on the farm, I had this kitten that I rescued from the dangerous farm. And I used to let him come in at night and sleep. There was a, an extra room and I'd let him come in and sleep on the bed. So I would open the door at night. He would run in and then he'd wait at the door and I'd go open the bedroom door and he'd go and jump down the bed and go to sleep. It was so cute. Hold on, I'm going to close this. There we go. It was so sweet. And then as he got older, I didn't want him coming in all the time. And so I stopped, I tried stopping doing it. And then uh, I had to really try to, you know, get him to wean him out of the behavior. And then one night, I came and I looked. I thought he would just, he was just, he got the point. But it was like two in the morning and he was still waiting at the door, shivering. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, man, that broke my heart. Of course, I had to let him in. But I just love when they're like, just the idea that he's like, hey, I have this deal with this girl and she does this for me and I trust in her. I believe in her and I'm going to wait here. It just breaks my heart. Um, I just love animals so much. Extensive childhood abuse is still instills a powerful people are dangerous program. Believe me, I have that program running. <laughs> um, my, in retrospect, I can clearly see it as my self-compassion increased, my toxic shame decreased. I love this. So yeah, he is talking about how, how do we get over the toxic shame? The self-compassion. So when I find myself acting in ways or being treated in poorly, I used to feel bad about it, just generically bad. Then I became aware that, okay, it wasn't a generically bad feeling. It was me like attacking myself for being attacked by others. And so then I, yeah, I just started developing that, com that compassion. Uh, clients were also being overpowered and or abandoned in relationships as abusive and neglectful as the one they had with their parents. <clears throat> that hurts. 
gotta admit. When you realize, yeah, I, I remember off, like in, in pretty much all of my relationships, my past relationships, I had the same feeling and dynamic that I had with my mother, which was, why can't she see how much I'm suffering? And constantly just wanting her to see and, to, and, 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 and just being completely shut out, neglected, overlooked. Maybe you can relate. When a parent is unrelentingly toxic, hearing even a few words from them can trigger the survivor into an intense emotional flashback. I have worked with numerous clients who made very little progress in their recovery while they maintained contact with the toxic parents. So that is something that, you know, I knew. I knew I'd have to get away from my mother. But like I, I talked in that video um, to Brini Lee about men who are going to treat you the way they want to treat their mother. And then they'll treat their mother really sweet to her face. Right. So I would this book, this talks about how if you're trying to have a relationship with someone who's still in contact with toxic parents, they're going to be having flashbacks. So what that means is they're going to be projecting onto you and the, the parent gets to go, oh, hey, sweetie, whatever, blah, 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 hang up the phone. And then you're the one there for hours. Right. Who gets to deal with the flashback that they don't know what they're having. And nobody deserves that. Um, and I've done that to people too. Um, yeah. Be authentically yourself. It is unreasonable and unfair to expect anyone to accept you if you are being abusively angry or contemptuous. Learning to handle conflict in relationship. Hey girl on a planet. Long time no see. Good to see you. You are an old school subscriber on this channel. <laughs> oh, well, on my original channel. So it's good to see you. And I circled this to come back to. It's a book called Beyond the Marriage Fantasy. And you all know I'm obsessed with relationships between men and women, um, dating, marriage. Um, before I got married, I wanted to make sure that I knew as much as I possibly could about how to be a good wife, how to resolve conflict, how to choose the right person. Hey, Annette, good to see you. You made it over here, too. <laughs> oh, thank you all, everyone. So good to see you. <laughs> so, yeah, I this is a book I have not heard of. Um, so, yeah, I just circled it because I'm definitely going to check it out. Oh, man, this was so good, too. Self-mothering grows compassion. This is where I am good now. I, 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 I'm getting this together. Unconditional love is only appropriate and developmentally helpful during the first two years or so of life. I feel proud of myself that I figured that out myself before I read that in this book. People are like, oh, we, you get married or you get in a relationship, you love the person unconditionally. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So she learns little by little, little that other people also have rights and needs. That's the toddler who's healthy. Toddlers who uh, were raised by narcissistic parents probably didn't learn that. Once again, psychological health is based on having about two years of this no questions asked entitlement to unconditional love. Some people get it, some people don't. Some parents can shower love on babies, but as soon as the child begins toddling around and expressing a will of her own, they become severely punishment and re punishing and rejecting. That happened to me. I think my mother really had a thing for babies. Like she really liked babies, uh, breastfeeding, the excitement and attention that came with the baby. But as soon as you know we started wanting our own things or being quote unquote difficult, you can't control a toddler. You can control a baby, but not really a toddler. Um, that was when, you know, the rage and the anger and all that. <clears throat> we cannot help desperately wanting the unconditional love we were so unfairly deprived of, but we cannot as adults expect others to supply our unmet early entitlement needs. Um, 
yeah, that was one thing that I had to come face to face with is that that's what I was using relationships for. And I wasn't able to see myself doing it, but I could feel my partner doing it to me and I get angry. And then I realized, oh man, I was doing the same thing. Limits of unconditional uh, love. Oh, I put wow here. What's this? Unconditional positive. Oh, yes, I love this. Miraculously, I have seen the unconditional positive regard of a therapist be enough on numerous occasions to significantly repair the damage of not being parentally um, loved. Isn't that beautiful? Man. So that's one thing I have gotten from therapy too. It's like, I remember not knowing how therapy worked. And, you know, a lot of things for CPTSD, they're like, therapy, talk therapy doesn't work. For me, it's about having a, a responsible adult there who has my best interest in mind, who is giving me attention and who is listening and, and helping. Just having that space where I can kind of rest and breathe, regardless of whether the therapy is good or not. And so here he is. He's, he figured that out, too. Nonetheless, romantic love can be a significant source of therapeutic, unconditional like love. Unconditional like love. That's, that's more accurate. For me, I think the condition on love ends when you're with someone who is hurting you or hurting themselves. You ask them to get help and they won't. When, it, when a person won't get help, that's when you got to... You can't say, well, I'll just keep loving you through this and we'll just keep suffering. It's like, no. Um, this talks about inner child work and it says, it shows your inner child that you're now, they're in a place where they're protected by a warm and powerful adult. And that is what I would say I have become in the work I have done. And I hope many of you can relate to that too. Self-fathering heals the wounds of being helpless to protect yourself from parental abuse. Oh, that cut like a knife. And by extension from other abusive authority figures. Are we not experiencing that on a global scale now? Abuse of power of authority figures. You walk in the store and the person getting paid $12 an hour is going to yell at you what to do the second you step in there. I don't know how many times that's happened to me over the past two years. I ignored them every time. Nobody yells at me. Assertiveness. Yes, dealing with oh, issues of narcissism are a form of PTSD, girl on the planet. Yes, thank you for sharing. Oh, wait, where did my screen go? Okay. Are we still on? <laughs> okay. Um... Self-fathering builds assertiveness, self-protection, <laughs> and the world got issues. Uh, effectively confront external and internal abuse, standing up for the adult child's rights. I have seen so many people, men who are just weak. They're weak here. They're so weak. Um, and this is something I had to do repeatedly for myself as a child over and over again. And so I have a strength there, but I still need to work on that. But it's, it's sad. It's sad when you see men who um, they don't have, even men who did have fathers. I don't know what it is. I, I tend to attract, and I have in the past, like just men who have weak fathers. But I see it everywhere, the, the, the results of it everywhere. It's sad. You should get this book. Complex PTSD, Surviving to Thriving by Pete Walker. And I, I, I do want to encourage anyone to watching to get the book. Um, these are just the parts that are important to me, but there may be completely other parts that really hit home for you. Oh, I love this. So he talks about what he does for his inner child work of avenging the injustice and one of them is that he tells his inner child he'll report his parents to the authorities so they'll be sent to counseling to learn how to be a better parent. And I loved that. <laughs> his adult self consistently rising to his defense. Oh, it's just, oh, that's really beautiful, you know? 
uh, a person who can do that for themselves and for others. I'm really proud of myself for the way I've stood up for myself and others, just with um, dignity and grace. Sometimes less so, sometimes more so. But I'm proud of myself that I can do that. I've just been around so many people who let me down in that way throughout my entire life. So that's, I think bravery and courage are like something that I didn't realize were so important to me and other people that I have in my life. The need to have mothering and fathering type support from others is a lifelong need. I rarely see uh, the next circle of intimates who I rarely see anymore, but who have shared enough intimacy with, with me in the past that I now draw comfort from imagining them caring, caring for me in the present. So he's talking about how he's developing um, the resources to have that feeling of lifelong mothering and fathering from a bunch of different people, from a network of people and experiences. And I love that. And I've had to do that as well. Why did I circle this? Oh, uh, yeah, he's talking about all the different um, resources of people that you could get, like, positive regard from. And I love this. The final circle is occasional strangers who from time to time I'm graced to have easy and comforting interactions with. I have a lot of those, too. I don't know what it is. Like, strangers that just like me. They open up to me. They treat me good. They go out of their way to help me. I don't know what it is. I feel lucky. Um, even here in Mexico, there's this little old lady who wor works pushing carts at the Walmart. And every time she sees me, she says something to me really fast in Spanish. And you want to know something very strange? Every single time, I know exactly what she's saying. I don't speak the language yet, but it's like, I don't know. I don't know if it's like a bit of telepathy or if it's just an energetic thing. But the first time I came there, she said... You know, she said something to me, and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, and she started, she's like, yeah, yeah, we were kind of like laughing together, but she, I knew that she was saying something about it being hot, and I was like, yeah, it is hot, so I, I have no idea how I knew that, I know, yeah, anyway, so I, ha I, I really love interactions with strangers, I, I, was, I had, used to have so many meaningful interactions that I wrote them down, I need to get back into doing that, um, uh, the more self-supportive we become, the more we attract supportive others. The more we are supported by others, the more we can support ourselves. I just love this. Because the better it gets, the better it gets. And you just need to take one little step. And, you know, one positive regard from a, a person can start that ball rolling for someone and it makes a big difference. Before we become discerning enough to choose truly safe and helpful support, man, I have messed this up. I have um, just believed in people who said like, oh, I want to help you, or oh, I'm here for you, or I'm your friend, and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, you realize that that's what they want to be, or that's how they want to think of themselves. But are they actually like that? No, not really. Or the people who actually are jealous of you, or whatever it is. They have, or maybe they're wrapped up in their own problems so much that, you know, they can't, they have no regard for others. Another key sign of recovering is that your criti critic begins to shrink. You develop a kind of mindfulness that recognizes when the critic has taken over. This happened to me, especially when I first got to Mexico. Um, yeah, when I had uh, culture shock. I always read these phenomenons, phenomena, <laughs> and I always tend to think, oh, these won't happen to me, like stages of grief or like whatever it is. So I heard about culture shock. And I'm like, nah, no, I'll be fine. The culture shock hit me on the second day immensely badly. And then these voices just started coming in like, oh, yeah, you are so dumb. You made a massive mistake. A person like you should never be doing something like this, blah, 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 blah. And then I realized, I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> I was like, this is my, you know, you're not, this is, this is my space in my head. I don't need to listen to this. This is complete bullshit. It's not real. And I don't believe these thoughts. Bye-bye. <laughs> I didn't know you moved to Mexico. Girl, this has been only a week long, okay? The video is coming on my main channel um, next week. And you all hear all about it. 
<laughs> so don't worry, you're not, not in the loop. I did talk about it on my Instagram, though. So I don't know if you're on my Instagram, you would know if you watch the stories. So you develop the kind of mindfulness that recognizes when the critic has taken over. Even if you can't stop the critic, just being like, oh, that's the critic. You stop persecuting yourself for normal foibles and you perseverate less in, a point, in disappointment about other people's minor mis miscues. Yeah. And that's another thing that I noticed about myself is that my criticism of others would be a signal to me that my inner critic was alive and well and probably attacking me too. And I regret that. Your ability to relax. You, so you, beca you get a better ability to relax. Another sign of um, recovery. This means you only fight back when under real attack, only flee when odds are insurmountable, and only freeze when you need to go into acute observation mode, and only fawn when it is appropriate to be self-sacrificing. I love this because he's taken the fight, flight, freeze, and fawn, and said, hey, here's when it actually is appropriate. There is a time when it's appropriate to fawn. There is a time when it's appropriate to flee or fight. I was like, man. Thanks, Mike Powers. Yeah, this will be uploaded to the channel after, so you can definitely check in on it. And I hope everyone gets a chance to grab this book. I just got mine off Amazon. Stages of recovering, the phase of intensely grieving our childhood. See how much highlighting I have left in here. Whoa, okay, only a couple more. Wow. We'll see how far we can go. <laughs> there is a volcano here. And the air was really smoky yesterday. I had trouble breathing last night. I had phlegm in my lungs and I was coughing. And my eyes were getting itchy and irritated. Um, it's better today, but my voice is kind of smoky because of it. I went to the pharmacies here. Um, they have, I can buy a nebulizer here. And apparently I, I, I think that nebulizing glutathione would be really beneficial for me for a number of reasons um, but also just to help me with my lungs and with the smoke <laughs> and I went to the stage and uh, I went to the, uh, the pharmacy and the woman told me you know no no blah 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 turistas blah 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 turistas <laughs> so I think she was basically telling me that yep I have that glutathione but I can't sell it to foreigners or something um, and I'm just going to accept that. But I did go to a couple of other pharmacies. and So yeah, it looks like I don't get to nebulize um, the glutathione like I wanted. But I am going to try nebulizing uh, eucalyptus oil, which I'm sure I can probably get a hold of a lot easier. So yes, that's my big long story on that. Um, so let's see, this is a chapter we can kind of end out. Let's see. Oh no. Oh, it does. Okay, there'll be part one. Okay, you know what? It ends at a part two, so I'm gonna finish this. <clears throat> the phase of intensely grieving our childhood losses can last for a couple of years. You guys remember, those of you who've been with my channel uh, you know that there was like a stage, like years that I went through where I was just constantly talking about my mother did this, I didn't have that, my dad did this, he didn't have that, right? And it was like I was stuck on that mode. And I think that was what was going on because I'm starting to feel like I'm, I'm, like, I'm aware that I'm ready to move on from that. When sufficient progress is made in grieving, the survivor naturally drops down into the next level of recovery work, grieving our loss of safety in the world, grieving the loss of our self-esteem. Uh, impulses to help and care for yourself naturally begin to arise. Yes. I put a heart here. New positive habit of rescuing ourselves from shame and self-hate takes on its own life. 
In survival mode, even the most tri trivial and normally easy tasks can feel excruciatingly difficult. Lord, who else knows what this is about? I can tell you just, oh, how many times where I was like, I had some kind of form to fill out or something like that. And I was like, ah, uh, you know, I'm just going to stay in bed all day. <laughs> I'm just gonna stay in bed all day and I think about it and I just feel even more tired. I'm gonna take some of my coconut water, hold on. So yeah. I hear that. <laughs> I believe uh that regressions are sometimes a call from our psyche to address important developmental arrests. I've seen uh regressions in people over this past year. I've seen a regression in myself. So if you're finding you're regressing back to your teenage rebellion, or for me, I regress back to my toddler abandonment, you have to freak out at yourself. Just be like, oh, hey, this is a thing that I still need to work on, and that's why this is coming up for me. And what can I do to help myself through this time? Since the need to develop a staunch and unyielding self sense of self-protection now that's not defensiveness right and that goes back to what he said back here about fight flight freeze or fawn that's like knowing are you being defensive against people who actually want to help you <laughs> and then letting the toxic people in right i'm gonna struggle with someone doing that in my life so yeah oh man when this stuff gets completely mixed up on people it's just you can't get through this on your own. It's just so warped and twisted. Um, fiery willingness to defend ourselves so that we can withstand inner critic attacks, right? So you learn to stand up for yourself in the outer world and then you can uh, stand up for yourself in your inner world. So what have I got here? Difficulties in identifying the signs of recovery. Here are some common areas where there, I see that recovering survivors fail to notice and self-validate their progressive degrees of improvement. I love this because I, am, like I said, my self-compassion is building. I do these things now. Less intense launching into the fight, flight, freeze, or sponsor spots. Increasing resistance to the critic. Increased mindfulness about flashbacks or inner critic attacks. Increased time feeling good enough about yourself progress in meeting arrested developments listed in chapter two yes decreased overeating or use of self-medicating substances i have lost a lot of weight <laughs> and i'm feeling great increased experiences of good enough relating with others that has been happening as i mentioned yesterday the people who i went out with um for dinner here in Mexico are expats who they're not typically the kind of people I'd hang out with in the past I would probably be judgmental and grumpy but you know I'm just open calm relaxed and I found that my experience of them was similar you know we had some great laughs we all shared stories everyone was like easy going got along just fine I didn't know them that well um, they're good friends with my friend here and when they were leaving they gave her a hug this couple and then they came and gave me a hug, which was really cute. You know, it was really nice. They don't know me that well. I'm like, oh, sure. I'll, yeah, I'll take this nice hug. How sweet is that? Um, decrease in the painfulness and intensity of flashback feelings. Uh, it helps me to see my CPTSD as somewhat analogous to diabetes, a condition that will need management throughout my life. He's talking about accepting. Accepting recovery is a lifelong process. I love this. Um, I heard someone talk about it, um, about childhood trauma or abuse as being like, I have a missing limb. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I have to accept that it's not going to grow back. You know, I'm not going to get a good mom and dad that I wish I had. No, um, I have this missing limb. It's kind of always going to be there, but because I know it's there, I can do things to support myself to manage it. And I can be kind to myself by not expecting it to grow back or being upset that it's gone because it's gone. There's, the chance for it is gone and it will never happen. And I just accept that and I support myself through it. CPTSD, when officially managed, efficiently managed, essentially bestows 
gifts. Do you just love this? Annette Rogers, that's a wonderful way to look at it. Yes. But do you just love this? When I read this line, I just imagined holding my hands out and colorful jewels falling into my hands. The jewels that were initially the tears falling from my eyes. Healthy self-assertion was punished like a capital crime in many dysfunctional families. Who else can hear that? And this talks about what that does to you. Bravery is, in my opinion, defined by fear. It is taking right action despite being afraid. It is not brave to do things that are not scary. I'm going to take this and print it out and, and, and tattoo it on my forehead. I love this. As you guys know, to me, bravery and courage. Those are big to me. Uh, so this is some reframing of negative feelings, which I thought was useful. Lifelong learning is widely recognized as one of the key practices necessary to avoid Alzheimer's disease. You get all these people, oh, I got Alzheimer's in my family. Oh, I got Alzheimer's, this and that. You can find some real psychological causes for it that show that it can be lessened or avoided instead of just accepting. Silver linings. Evolve out of the emotional, impoverished. Oh, I love this. Those who work an effective recovery program not only recover significantly from emotional damage, but also evolve out of the emotional impoverish, impoverishment of the general society. Is this not true? That the people who like have had the worst difficulties and problems and everything else, when they work through it, they become like these really grounded, deep, empathic, compassionate, interesting people capable of great depth of feeling and fun and insight and wisdom and friendship. And that's one of those gifts that you're holding out your hands and when your tears fall, eventually they turn to jewels. Perhaps the greatest reward of improved emotional intelligence is seen in a greater capacity for deeper intimacy. Emotional intelligence is a foundational ingredient of relational intelligence, a type of intelligence that is also frequently diminished in the general populace. <laughs> okay, we know this. You all know exactly what I'm talking about. The fluoride stairs. And the I'm fine, how are you? And the, you know, all, all the, the, the flippant responses people give about their emotional states, about their family, about accepting bad behavior, about excusing other people. It's very, it's much easier to do that than it is to really want to take that deep dive and, and become um, an improved person. Is the attainment of a much richer internal, internal life? That's another silver lining in recovery. That is the truth. The survivor who follows the introspective road less traveled becomes increasingly free of compulsive and unconscious allegiance to unhelpful familial, religious, and societal values that were instilled at an impressionable age. I've got this highlighted, starred. <laughs> like, these are the people that I want and I'm interested in and that I like and that I love. And I would say this applies to my new friend who I made here in Mexico. I would say she fits in with that. She's mentioned briefly that her childhood was an absolute gong show. Her family was an absolute gong show. And here she is. You know, she's a uh, you know, cornerstone of a community she's working on. She's got her life together. She recovered her complete health. Uh, I'm probably going to have her in a video upcoming on my channel. She's like an amazing person. She's in her, in her mid-40s. The survivor who pursues long-term development on his journey of recovering generally achieves greater overall evolution than the average citizen can I get an amen. For many undramatized people, the pursuit of ongoing learning often stops after their last formal learning experience, whether that is high school or college. Praise Jesus, we know this is the truth. 
Give me a 100. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a laughing emoji. You all know this is the truth. Come on. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so I've got this highlighted. Uh, what is this? Oh, this is about men who are obsessed with sex and porn. Stay very far away. <laughs> Thanks, Annette. Oh, we made it to part two. I got a thumbs up from Annette. That's excellent. All right. Anyone else watching, if you could hit that thumbs up, if you haven't done so already, that would be great and help this video reach more people. And we are going to pick up part two in another video. But look how much we got through. That's pretty good. And I hope you all kind of took something away from that. And maybe I'll pick up that book if it will benefit you. I'm going to go. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. And I'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Bye for now.